Didn't Baba love ice cream? Yeah. And in fact, um, Gustaji, Baba's, you know, longtime disciple all the way from the beginning. Uh, his, Baba said his last son's scars were connected with, with ice cream. And when he came here in 1952 with Baba, there were several men and they all had an allowance. And so Gustaji, when he was here, there were a little restaurant downtown and they'd get something to eat. And all Gustaji ever uh, ate were milkshakes. <laughs> I mean, he loved milkshakes, and uh, so it carried over <laughs> from India. <laughs> and I don't know if I I I may not know. We need some young people to do the checkups on this, but I think it might have been in during one of those ice cream parties at Guru Prasad that he might have passed on. But I, I'm not, I, I'm not one hundred percent certain on that. When Diane's dad, well, our dad was at the end of his his life. He was um, lying in bed, and his brain was doing whatever it wanted to do. But he was holding what appeared to be an ice cream cone and licking it. And it was uh -huh. all, loved ice cream. It was always such a peaceful thing for us yeah. to see him do, like. That's one of Baba's uh, uh, better inventions, creations, within the creation. <laughs> no, they had, there was one wealthy Baba person, I think he was from Bombay, who would uh, sponsor these ice cream parties at Guru Prasad, big vats of ice cream, and Baba himself would dole it out. And Baba's favorite was, flavor was uh, mango, mango ice cream. That's tasty. Yeah. What's not to like about mango ice cream? Oh, God. <laughs> One time up on the hill, Mansari, made, in the summer, she would make uh, mango ice cream. That was the season, you know, summer meaning uh, May, something like that. And she made, and it was very, very hot. And I once ate, I mean, two, uh, two scoop bowls. 14 of them, I could not stop eating. It was so good. Uh, and I was also thirsty. <laughs> and nobody said stop, huh? I, no, I just kept going back. That was so great. <laughs> 14. I've never done anything like that. I mean, two scoops would be about my limit now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Hey, Mayor Nas, nice to see you. That was nice hearing about Aspandiar today. Wasn't that great? Yeah. Farshid is such a good speaker. Yeah, that was, what a soul he was. Melanie, did you ever meet Aspandiar? Yes, a couple times. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, he was really beautiful. I mean, he was really in a beautiful place. <laughs> Like very profoundly harmonized, even down here at the, at the at the street level, truly harmonized. Was yeah, that, yeah, he, Terry. Or was he a um, Mandalay? Yeah, well, he was one of those prem ashram boys that oh. Baba had back in the mid sixty uh, <laughs> mid twenties. Mm -hmm. He was the first of the prem ashram boys who, who were really on fire. Uh, about divine love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And isn't he believed to have been on the sixth plane? He could very well have been. If I if I were to put any money down, it would be on that. Yeah. Uh, Marinaz, Marinaz's father was one of the Prem Ashram boys too. Wow. What were you going to say, Marinaz? No, I was going to say that uh, Baba told the Sandhya that he is on third plane. And And then I heard that he... He was on the third and then the, he was on the sixth and then the third and then went back to the sixth. But I don't know where I got the yeah. information, but. Yeah, Baba said when he came as a boy, as a teenager, he was on the third plane when he arrived. That was 19, you know, 1926, I think. So he made some progress. Yeah, truly beautiful soul. And so 
Marin asks, what did your father have? Was your father who was in the Prem Ashram? Your father? Yes, he was uh, spent with my... Uh, wait, wait, I have to... Louder, uh, louder, yeah. Yeah, I can hardly hear you. Was um, spent the same time as Espandier went, uh, mm -hmm. but he was little. He was only, he was the youngest boy. He was only eight, almost eight. And Espandier was 13. So Espandier was the oldest among the boys and, and uh, uh, he was the youngest and how long was your father there was a year one year and did, yeah. did he talk a lot about it did he have lots of memories he had and he told us so many but unfortunately our memory is gone so bad we had we should have written all down uh -huh. it's not knew. too late to grab whatever yeah. you have now yeah. let's yeah. do a meeting <laughs> The, I mean, those days when you hear it, um, you think that it's, it is, he's there, he's going to be there, or he's going to tell you again, and he's going to tell you again. You don't, you don't know that one day they'll be gone. So, Did yeah, we, and we, we are six children, so we often ask each other, call and ask each other, what did you say at the time when he said such and such thing? Do you remember? Yeah. And one said, oh, yeah, I remember that part. Let's do a Zoom meeting with all six of you. Exactly. Yeah. exactly. And, and you're scattered yeah. all over. Yeah. So Let's do that. To come together. And, and this is what we were saying. We've got to come together and, uh, and really put pieces together. Because it's just difficult. I called my sister and said that, you know, I remember he talked to me like that. And he told me like, my sister said, oh, really? But I think that he told me like that. And I'm... You know, yeah. it's it's difficult. At the time, we should have write, write it down. We didn't know. And I was what, a young girl. I was the youngest, and yeah. the others were, um, you know, get married or another city or whoever thought. And what we, year did he pass away? Say again. Father, sorry. What year did your father pass away? May I ask? It's going to be now thirteen years. Oh. So. Um, Mm -hmm. Not uh, 2008. 2008. Yeah. So it's going to be this this Christmas, exactly the day on the Christmas he passed. Um, so Christmas going to be 13. Did you ever get a sense of how it affected his life? Say it again. I, I, I said, did you ever get a sense on how really it? living in that ashram affected his life? Oh, absolutely. I mean, this was, I don't know how to explain it, but they don't live in this world, if I can say it correctly. Yeah. So we, we, we could tell that he's different. Oh. We could tell that he's thinking different. Uh -huh. um, oh. I mean, a man who wakes up every single night mm -hmm with no alarm, nothing, at two o'clock. And then in his room, he has his bowed uh, forehead down in front of Baba's picture. And in that position on his knees, his forehead down for hours. What do you think of that? Wow. You know, he's, I mean, he was my father, but he was, way beyond that i i you know as a child i was at home with him until i was um 19. and actually uh, i should say until 18 one year i was living in another city because um i was applying for college and i was getting ready for college so i was in another city so up to 18 i was with him i was living with him um but most of the time he was, was out of town because he was a farmer and he was working outside the city. And, but the time when he coming home and now he's staying one month or two months, he was like that. And I would look at him sometimes and I question myself, you know, do I want him like this? I was, I was a teenager. And I look at him and said, do I want him like this? I want him a little bit more, you know, as a, as a, as a normal dad that everybody else had. You see what I'm saying? 
Yes. Um, but on the other hand, I knew that he's different. I, I had that understanding that and, he's in different world. And would your mother sometimes explain him to you? Would you discuss this with your mother and would she give you any Absolutely, insight? yes, absolutely. But my mom was so much in love with him that um, I don't know. When I say love, it, 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 she knew exactly. I mean, I think at the time when they got married, without him telling her anything, she knew that this man is different and I'm not going to be having a normal life. Am I ready for it or I'm not ready for it? <clears throat> but uh, he, she, she stayed with him all these years and she truly was in love. And I remember when she passed on um, before, she was just telling us that, please bring your dad here. Please bring your dad here. Now, my dad is here. He was just going away for few minutes away and then I remember at the time um, that she passed on she wanted my dad's hand in her hand in order to feel so safe and secure to pass on so and I I cannot never ever forget that moment that she felt so much peace mm -hmm. having his hand and feeling just so secure. And then she closed her eyes. And so she knew from the beginning. Yeah, for sure. What we're doing, uh, just a, a break in here. Uh, Marinaz's uh, father was one of the Pram Ashram boys from the mid, uh, mid 20s, all the way back. And, you know, if you met some of these Pram Ashram boys, they were and when they were older, they were like embodiments of of divine reverence for Baba. I mean, it was, it was, you know, just a reverence. Uh, you know, you just can't imagine. And did they stay uh, friends with each other, the Prem Ashram boys? Or were they scattered once Baba disbanded the school? Mernas, I'm, I was it's asking you if... He stayed. If your if your father stayed friends with some of the other and stayed in touch with some of the prem, other prem ashram boys. Yes. So the other boy was actually his brother. The twin. Oh. There were twin brothers. Yeah, oh. that they went. Uh -huh. And the other one was Esfandiar. Uh -huh. And now Esfandiar was living in a different city, mm -hmm. but for the fact that they were from a smaller community, meaning that there was a rastrain. Um, for different kind of gatherings or function, they would see each other anyways. Uh -huh. So um, yeah, they knew each other. I mean, mm -hmm. just because of their, they were a small group. They were minority in other, in other words, mm -hmm. uh, in the country. So no matter where you go and live in the country, you end up together because you know each other. Um, some other boys uh, that they were um, from India, I don't know. Um, I don't know if he ever kept in touch with them. No. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, all of yeah. that. Excuse me, so do we know if any of them are alive still? I think my uh, dad was the last one, last one. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. I, I, your dad and his brother, that when they would come to the center, I'd uh, take them to do, they wanted to do some work for Bob. So, uh, you know, like, for example, we went out to the barn and there are four chairs there that Baba sat on. And I, you know, I gave them uh, uh, dust rags and, and all of that. <laughs> and 
the two of them were like that, you know, they got every, I mean, some of this had like wood carvings and everything. They went and got every little nook and cranny. <clears throat> and I can't remember what was your father or your uncle, but underneath the Baba's chair, no one d does the dusting that thoroughly underneath the chair. <laughs> you know, these are elderly men like children under a chair. Just, Just incredible care of Meher Baba. Yeah. And and remind you that the uncle that you saw was not the one who was in Parashram. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. So that that one actually um he he passed on when he was um I think it was he was in his fifties. He had cancer. Uh-huh. He was in late fifties or early sixties he passed away, got cancer, passed away. So the one you saw is my other uncle, who, uh, uncle who was who was much younger than yeah. my dad. And okay. at the time, uh, he was way too young to be sent uh -huh. to Ramashram. But it was so sweet to see the reverence they had for Bob. <clears throat> no. Baba is love. I love Baba, you love Baba, Baba is love. <laughs> they had very simple English that just carried everything with it in the words. <clears throat> Jeff, I actually had a question. I was on that this morning as well. It was wonderful and uh, very beautiful. And I've been watching, I think I mentioned this before, I've been watching the series on living with Mayor Baba at Maribah that um, Peter Nardine did a few years back for the, uh, I think the GLOW perhaps, Narshwan, and uh, really a significant, uh, it's extraordinary to watch. And I was remembering that he said something in the very first part in those early days about the Prem Ashram that the tavern that, that Baba had opened the tavern and allowed more wine, if you will, to those boys than he ever has since. And something like that was said. Um, and and uh, from what I keep gathering is that their depth of love and their expression of it was so palpable for everyone who ever came in their contact. And now I'm getting it over, you know, the airwaves, but it but I, I was just thinking how the, that collection of souls and uh, how intoxicating it, I mean, I just can't even imagine that. Anyway, if, if people haven't seen that series, it's very uh, remarkable to watch. And of course it's uh, on YouTube as well. So I recommend it highly. Yeah. And I thought it was very interesting when he shared today about being with Darwin <laughs> and between Espandiar and translating it in that whole experience that happened. I mean, that was just extraordinary. So in Del Ruba, anyway. So Jay Baba, everyone. Jay yeah, Baba. beautiful. Yeah. <clears throat> and uh, Ray is asking what the name of the video is. Maybe Jay Simha might know. You... I'll put it in the chat. I know what it is. Yeah. I'll just okay. I'll just put it in the chat for everybody. It's a, a series of four parts because they're, they're very long at several hours. Ah, good. No, Peter gives you, he know, he's like a historian. He knows it and he gives it, he delivers this in such a, an enjoyable way. Very entertaining. I mean, it, it, there's so much that he gives you that you really can't, I mean, I can only watch about an hour at a time and then I have to kind of stop. And I realized there were people there at this seminar and it must've been just an extraordinary experience. So anyway, it was beautiful. Yeah. That was nice though today, wasn't that? You could remember the times with Espandiar. He was quite, quite a, a beautiful soul, truly beautiful, you know. His, his company was so blissful. It was yeah. unmistakable Baba's presence in his company. And he really didn't have to talk anything and uh, 
say anything. You just had to just sit in his company and you could feel all that love uh, flowing from him. Yeah, I mean, I found I could have sat in that room for seven years without doing anything. And I mean, I was like stopped. Yeah. I mean, you just didn't, the normal kind of sons cars that come along and say, hey, you better do this or you better do that. It just was all nullified. You were just stopped in this expansive state. No, no need to go anywhere. It's, it's, yeah, it was quite extraordinary. And Darwin was, uh, we used to say about Darwin that he could have just come in to the discourse meeting and just read the North Myrtle Beach phone book and you still would have felt filled to the brim. <laughs> yeah. Well, Angela, what do you think? Do you think we should um, go with? It's an excellent time for a moment of silence. Okay. J. Baba. So, everybody come out of their um, reverie there. <laughs> um, so, most of you, I think everybody has been here before, and <clears throat> Angela's going to choose somebody to do some reading and you can pass on that. And uh, then afterwards, you read a section and anybody wants to share something in relation to that, feel free, don't be shy. <clears throat> you know, you don't wanna think 20 years later, darn it, I should have said that. <laughs> so anyway, in, in this next section, uh, Darwin brings up this, one of the major themes of this, um, book, which is, excuse me, is uh, to get out of the way, our getting out of the way, so Baba can work in us, and Baba can work through us. And so, how is that done? And there are various ways, and, and one of the ways that Darwin would say, <clears throat> he used to say, <clears throat> don't think of yourself as a base of operations. Think of yourself as a conduit. Think of yourself as a vehicle. And now most people on the <clears throat> on the planet think of themselves. I'm a you know a base of operations. This is my domain, and that's your domain. And, but this is a different paradigm altogether. That you are a, a conduit. He used to use that word conduit. <clears throat> and you know, as musicians, their whole aim is to <clears throat> to be able to to express the music so it goes through uh, without much interference from the ego. I mean, that's the, 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 the intention and, you know, getting out of the way. And one of the ways that Kitty emphasized, Kitty Davy is, you know, and Darwin, of course, too, in cultivating Baba's companionship, his presence, it, it kind of dissolves some of that ego so that what's deeper within can come flow through and I know with Kitty I sometimes I would be with her and others too and <clears throat> Kitty would be talking and then suddenly it would be like Baba was talking to you he, like he elbowed her aside and you get kind of a private interview with Baba and then Kitty would come back in kind of oblivious of the whole process it was really something to behold and but one thing is, is that what Darwin introduces, and of course the Mondali, if you're not able to feel Baba's presence and, and his companionship, we can focus on those divine qualities in us that come directly from Baba. You know, the, we've talked about that, you know, empathy, gratitude, patience, generosity, humor, um, Let's see what forgiveness, those qualities in us are really Baba. And when they come through us, they usually go through us without, they have a top priority. They kind of come through and the ego kind of gets pushed aside. 
And um, so I'm going to read what, and, but if you take one of those things, like a, a lot of the Baba people who come to the center are now feeling more and more a, a deep gratitude to Baba. And that's one of the divine qualities. But if you follow that gratitude upstream, you will, Baba will be right there. So, so anyway, this is what Baba said, uh, one of the messages that Baba gave that you've all heard, but it's, it's very much a part of Darwin's um, book. Baba says, to penetrate into the essence of all being and significance and to release the fragrance of that inner attainment for the guidance and benefit of others by expressing in the world of forms, truth, love, purity, and beauty. This is the sole game which has any intrinsic and absolute worth. All other happenings, incidents, and attainments can in themselves have no lasting importance. So, Anyway, let's go ahead and Angela, give us the page number. Otherwise, we're lost at sea. Uh, page 12 of the book. That's the beginning of chapter three. It's page seven of the PDF. Uh, chapter three, our master's loving help. Ideally, we will realize that we can remove our own false self from the scene enough so that Baba can work. We become onlookers observing what is happening. In other words, we are not trying to direct Baba. We are getting out of his way and allowing him to work on us. Darwin Shaw. Cleaning out the Ogean stables of the subconscious mind requires our close attention and earnest effort. It is not something that is easily done because we are locked into our misconceptions and imprisoned by our perception of who we are, what we are, and what creation is. We have to unlock all these things that keep us bound to a sense of helplessness, limitation, and ignorance. It really is a Herculean task, much more than we by ourselves can handle. We need the master's intervention. Meher Baba, the avatar, being one with universal consciousness and present in every individual mind is aware that each one of us is really God, but that we are veiled by illusory impressions. Therefore, Baba is not aloof from the individual. He is the embodiment of God's love and his love is for each one of us. It is not just an overshadowing blanket of love for masses of people. It is a very personal and intimate love for each individual as an individual. He knows everything about us, all our weaknesses and strengths, as well as our potential. And he loves us unconditionally. He holds us to his heart very dearly and he draws us into his being. And this, I feel, is the great blessing of our relationship with him. Mm. Man. Beautiful. Wow. Yes, I, I just want to say I missed a lot of last week's gathering, so I listened to it. Most of it I listened to early, early this morning. And I, 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 it's so, um, which anyway, I thought it was a very, very powerful session last time. But this, what, is, what Darwin is presenting right now to me is such a comfort, a comfort that we are not lost at sea, this uh, disillusionment and disenchantment and, <laughs> and the possible side effects of that for us as we move along. 
it really this what this was what Dan just read it was, to me was just saying and Baba is with you and Baba knows what you're going through and so um doesn't mean that the difficulty and suffering the suffering is not it cannot be keen or at least that's my own experience but if I mean, and sometimes I can't, I have, I lose the ability to feel Baba touching me on the inside. But when I can get back to that, then even all that, the, the difficulty, the disillusionment and disenchantment, there's like, and there's another television screen on <laughs> called the Baba screen. And by watching the Baba screen, there's a different message along with that message, you know, that message is there, but there is the Baba screen message. And, and so this is very, um, what a bountiful feeling it gives me. Yeah. Beautiful, Janet. Yeah. So true and so uh, assuring, reassuring. Yeah, I really like uh, the uh, image of the Augean stables because they were filled with horse manure. And that's what our subconscious is filled with. Years and years of lifetimes and lifetimes of, of horse manure. Yeah. And when, when someone tells you you're full of it, they, they're not too far off. <laughs> Theirs is proper English. One thing that uh, that that's, that Darwin always stressed, I mean, he says that this, it's not like Baba just kind of loves everybody. And then he goes around and visits mm -hmm. people like once a week or once every month. I mean, he is there. I don't know how he does it, but he's there every moment with each person, feeling what they're feeling, going through what they're feeling, you know, empathetic to everything that they experience. I, I like to say, I don't know how he does it. No one else can. <laughs> but D Darwin really stressed that it's personal with everybody, not even just th those, uh, even those who don't even uh, acknowledge Baba or don't even believe in God. He's personally with each one from beginning to end. It's not like you have to earn this um, attention. It's there, always. Page 13, individual flowers. Individual flowers. Like waiting for a flower to grow, Meher Baba is waiting for each one of us to withdraw from illusion. He is always watchful for those who are fed up and ready to turn away from the gross level to something more refined. The ego, anxious to preserve its illusory self, relies upon desires for those things that keep our attention riveted to the things of the gross world. It is not very easy to draw our attention away from all the desires and the things of this world, but sooner or later this must be accomplished, and Baba knows when we are ready to do that kind of work. The master's work by and large is to dissolve our superficial outer shell to awaken our dormant spiritual consciousness and to lift our consciousness out of the level of duality, which is all the opposites, gain and loss, beginning and end, pleasure and pain. In other words, he takes us from the illusory food of the Garden of Eden and gives us the food of the truth. He weans us away from the false and diffuses the energies of our sanskaras so they no longer have power over us, eventually wiping them out. But his main task is to turn our attention toward God, toward reality, deepening and expanding our love so that we will long for God, long for reality, for the light or truth even at the expense of denying ourselves completely. As the master within, 
he goes out of his way to push all of us closer and closer toward our own inner freedom until finally we are ready to let go of body consciousness altogether and live the life of the spirit. He knows exactly what each person needs rather than work with people in a general way. Uh, he works with each one of us in a unique manner designed to free our consciousness from bindings in the most efficient way. He understands all our karmic and sanskaric accumulation, and he knows what can be done to help us along. So it is not that we are doing this work on our own, struggling in the dark, some of our sand scars are tenacious and they can take years to wear out and see through so that we are actually free, inwardly free of all these bindings. We have to trust in Baba's ability to work with us in bringing about solutions for becoming more selfless and letting go of veils that are no longer necessary. Yeah, it was interesting hearing the, the tone kind of toward the beginning of that passage of, you know, like Bob is kind of on the lookout for when we're ready and then we're kind of drawn in, into him. And, and I guess toward the, the end of the passage, it was talking about possibly we're, we're kind of pushed along a little bit. And it's just interesting. I, I guess it, it happens differently for everybody. And I, I remember when I started the spiritual path, I, I certainly, for me, didn't feel like it was a, a mature, like, readiness and, and coming to it. it. It was like a life crisis that all of a sudden happened. And then all of a sudden, who I used to be, I, I was no longer able to be that person because of that crisis. And I was, like, forced into, uh, very uncomfortably, into another life. And then it turned out that was the only thing that could get me through it was by getting onto the path. So it, it's interesting how it goes for everyone. I, I guess it's just so unique as some people have a slow readiness and then others are kind of like they're going about their business and are, I guess, kind of pushed off the cliff, <laughs> which is looking back, I'm glad it happened that way because I, I would have never probably had the courage to come into it it was just, thank God, someone's like, okay, instead of getting in the pool, the cold water with your toe and then your foot, like, you know, your friend's going to just walk up behind you and just kind of push you and get it over with. <laughs> Jay Baba. Yeah. <laughs> That's what Angela, a Angela and the cliff, you know, she knows about cliffs. <laughs> um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, I noticed that Larry Pesto brought up the idea of uh, the diffusion <clears throat> of of energy and you know darwin in that one line says that there's a diffusion of our sanskaras and you know when you're living this worldly life now suddenly you're getting interested in in, in the divine there's a massive diffusion <clears throat> of of sanskaras some of them are going one way and some of them are going the other way but at least we're in a whole different <clears throat> now we're in a different inner place you know, it's, and a lot of the power of the sanskaras to just keep us addicted to the gross world kind of starts to let up a little bit as we turn more toward the divine in, in, in ourselves. Yeah. <clears throat> Anyone else? Okay. Well, well I had something to say. <laughs> yeah. Elizabeth. So actually I was going back to the, <clears throat> to the, our loving master's help. When it, that sentence about um, Mayor Baba, the avatar being one with universal consciousness and present in every individual mind is aware that each one is really God, but that we are veiled by illusory impressions. And we always talk about the lifting of the veil. And I was wondering, I guess I really hadn't focused on what that really means, but Illusory impressions are sanskaras. So the veils are the sanskaras. I mean, I, <laughs> I never really understood that. At least that's what it sounds like to me. Um, what was that last sentence? 
that the the illusory impressions are really our sanskaras. So when the veils are lifted, it's really the lifting of the sanskaras. Yeah. At least that's what that sentence says to me. Yeah. And then in this current um, section, um, it says, um, in other words, he takes us away from the illusory food of the quote, Garden of Eden, end quote, and gives us the food of truth. So I, I don't quite understand what he means by the illusory food of the Garden of Eden. I mean, I mean, I think of the story, you know, the apple and the, you yeah. know, all that, but um, I just don't understand the metaphor that he's trying to portray. Anybody, Anybody want to answer that? Huh. Uh, let's have Larry Pesta. That's referring to that, to the Genesis story of Adam and Eve. There was a choice of two trees in the garden. And they weren't supposed to eat this one tree that was going, it was the tree of knowledge. So they weren't supposed to eat that fruit because if they did, they would slip into dual consciousness. So it's a way of, it's a metaphorical, allegorical way of explaining how we have, why we're living in a world of duality. It was evidently, originally, a choice, a conscious choice that humans made was to live in the world of duality as opposed to unity. So it explains the separation from our divine nature. That's what I would say. Yeah, yeah excellent. Wow, thank you. I have never heard such a good description of the Garden of Eden. I mean, I know the story very well, but... I didn't realize it was the knowledge of really duality. And I guess that's creation. I mean, the, the uh, external expression that the, all the, all the uh, multitude of parts, but anyway, um, thank you, Larry. That was great. Yeah. <clears throat> Jay Baba, <clears throat> I just finished reading um, as only God can love. And um in addition to effort and grace, um, there's something about the way Darwin explains things that um, makes me feel the spirit. You know, it makes my um, frequency raise or whatever. And I feel like I'm living in the spirit when I read Darwin's words. He has a way of lifting my consciousness and then working with the um, divine qualities that Jeff talks about a lot has been so helpful. And speaking of the Garden of Eden, now I think I read it in this book um, and it just kind of it kind of blew my mind. And to me, the Garden of Eden is like Larry was explaining the illusory word, uh, world. But I think it was in Darwin's book, he said, we weren't meant to procreate, that humans weren't meant to procreate. And I was like, what? So. I don't know if, if it's because we chose um, instead of living maybe in the subtle body or whatever, we chose to live more in the gross form. But um, I don't know if it was in his book or something else I read online lately, but that was, it reminded me of that Garden of Eden story. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know <clears throat> whether Darwin said anything about uh, procreation. I, I can't remember, but... I'm not, I, don't, I, I, don't, I haven't read everything he wrote. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. This uh, chapter is so beautiful. Um, and Darwin takes us through uh, the idea of allowing ourselves to let Baba diffuse the energy of our sanskaras. But then it gets even better when he goes down to the very bottom and he talks about Baba actually... Uh, doing that for us as unique individuals. He knows exactly what each person needs and rather than work with people in a general way, he works with each one of us in a unique manner designed to free our consciousness from bindings in the most efficient way. He understands all of our karma and our sanskaras 
sun scar accumulations and he knows what can be done to and our sun scars accumulation. He knows what can be done to help us along. So this, this to me is another special Darwin reminds us of that Baba's uh, relationship with us and our relationship with him is just so, so personal and so um, private even to, to take that, to, to really embrace that. Um, because, and also, you know, being part of this group, it's a beautiful thing to like hear everybody uh, share and the sanskaric element beyond, you know, the sharing in a general way and I learned so much and then taking it back and be personal with Baba to, well, how do, you know, how does that sense guard manifest with me? How does that work with me? And Baba handles that and he's just so there. So this is just really special. And I just wanted to, to mention that. It's uh, heartfelt, isn't it? It's, it's from the heart when you realize Baba is diffusing sense scars and energies just for you. Yeah, beautiful. Designed, designed just for you. Wow. <laughs> Lovely. Yeah. And Ray? I thought um, I was going to say one thing, but Heidi just reminded me when I first came to Bob on the honeymoon. It, I think that you realize that. When you're on the honeymoon with Bob, when, when you when you come to him, you realize that's it. He is there with you personal, and it's so wonderful. So that, that's what Heidi reminded me of. What I was going to say is, uh, in the first part of it, he says, like waiting for a flower to grow, Mary Bob is waiting for each one of us to withdraw from illusion. He is always watchful for those who are fed up and ready to turn away from the gross level to something more refined. And then the end of the paragraph, Baba knows when we are ready to do that kind of work. So it's what I always it's what I always concentrate on. It's the free will. Baba doesn't force anybody to do anything. He'll let you go. Like like we've a lot of us have had kids, and I told my daughter, "Don't go over there," you know, in that spot, and she'd go. And I don't go over there, and all of a, ah, you know, I told you not to go over there. So he has to give us our free will, so we know when we're fed up. And um, that's what that passage is really beautiful. He's always watchful for those who are fed up and ready to turn away to, to something more refined. That's what I have to say. Beautiful, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Beautiful. And Rosalie? Thank you, Baba. Um, I have... Uh, I looked up Ogian because I knew it was a stable and it was full of shit anyway, but I look it up and it, it's just interesting. It says, legend of Ogias, king of Ellis or his stable, which holds 3000 oxen and remains unclean for 30 years. <laughs> And until Hercules, as one of his 12 labors, cleans it in one day by diverting a river. Well, it's, it's so funny that uh, the Ogean, you know, because it's not clean in one, one day. So it's funny, that's, that's the uh, example. But it is full of shit, that's for sure. Full of <laughs> sanskaric shit. It is. <laughs> Yeah, <clears throat> and and you know basically you're d diverting Baba's love and grace uh, yeah. through our subconscious stables to uh, and to clean them out. That's what's happening. <laughs> also, I think just that word sanskara, it, it has scar in it. You know, if you hurt your body, you get a you could very often get a scar if it's a heart bad enough hurt so it's so interesting that even though it's a different language it's scar it has it in it yeah yeah <laughs> yeah they're related languages 
and Thea? Um, I was going to say much the same thing as Jeff, just that um, that I've I've been really fascinated with the story of Hercules for a while. Of like, he's referred to as the demigod or the son of Zeus, right? So this is somebody you know advanced according to mythology, and the idea of diverting that love specifically is the same way I've always thought about. It. If you look at a lot of our those traditional Western or Occidental, I guess is the term specifically for it, but of mystical practices, water gets associated with the emotions and with kind of those heart feels. So you think about diverting a river of divinity through the stable of it, then yeah, you can clean out 30 years of, of crud in a day. Like if, you, if it's the master diverting that flow. Yeah. Um, but that's, that's how I read that specific story. Um, recently, since I went back, to, I was obsessed with myths when I was a kid. And then I have gone back to them a lot recently and that that has been a uh, um exactly kind of the interpretation i've, sh I've shared beautiful yeah thanks dia <clears throat> all right page 14 opting out of a duality game oh no you can't do that opting out of the duality game ultimately mayor baba is helping us reconstitute ourselves in the light of the highest truth as issues of matters that require reconstitution come up in our lives he helps us see through them and gradually understand ourselves these experiences force us to be flexible and not identify with the personality self the false self we gradually learn to be detached and say Oh, so that's what's happening now. We have to continuously adjust to inner and outer situations. They are constructions of Maya, that is illusion anyway. But I find that Baba facilitates our ability to cope with whatever is happening. I feel that this work of reconstituting is always going on and that he is working with each of us, whether we realize it or not. <clears throat> the avatar is completely unlimited and all powerful. His work within us is unlimited and all barriers can be resolved through his infinite power, which is an attribute of reality. His power is the power of truth, the sword of truth, slaying the falseness that makes us victims bound at subjective levels to material things. In fact, most of his work with us is at subjective levels because as Mayor Baba said, all finitehood and limitations are subject and self-created. The only limitations we have are those we have imposed on ourselves for ages we have been taking duality as our reality. And the master is trying to raise us out of that level. We have allowed all sorts of self-created conditions to make us happy or unhappy. When our only income comes from the master, we no longer participate in the duality game. He gives us and we are able to receive continuous light, continuous freedom, continuous reality. His love sustains us and becomes the primary force working through us. Wow. What I was um, looking at is the second to last sentence. He gives us and we are able to receive continuous light, continuous freedom, continuous reality. And as I read it again, and it says, and we are able to receive that but I have to say for myself, I don't always receive it. I mean, I'm able if I can. <laughs> it's like, which kind of able am I talking about here? I mean, it, it's not like Baba has made that, has limited my ability to do that. But those pesky sanskaras um, do limit it. And, and so sometimes I long to receive it, but I'm, I'm not in the conduit, should we put it that way? 
Yeah. <clears throat> we'll keep that on the table. That's that's a good good subject. Yeah, and Rosalie. Yeah, I love that. I, uh, I, I love that. I mean, Dar Darwin was into punning too. He liked punning. I love puns. But I love that our only income comes from the master. I mean, it's just, it just hit me so strong now because, uh, you know, uh, you know, feeling the limitation now of uh, you can't just kind of get about there's a dangerous virus and, you know, and uh, it's so, so interesting uh, that it's hitting so strong now at Thanksgiving that it's, you know, I mean, we all have to be so thankful, you know, and, uh, and yet it's interesting because it's kind of a feast of overeating, overindulging. I mean, I don't remember any Thanksgiving where I didn't eat too much. <laughs> and then you have to save for dessert. Anyway, I, I love that. When our only income, I will remember that. And the other thing that has helped me so much is give it all to Baba. And that really rings in my mind now. Um, and, uh, and then because it's in my mind so much, I think of, it comes up when I don't like something about myself. I thought, well, just give it to Baba. <laughs> Get rid of it. <laughs> anyway, J Baba. No. Darwin was, has been a help on my journey the whole way from the get go. Yeah. J Baba. Yeah. Excellent. Hi, everyone. J Baba. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. The first thing that really sticks out to me is that in the first paragraph here at the end, he phrase, he says, he helps us see through them um, and gradually, gradually understand ourselves. It, it, I'll just read that. As issues or matters that require reconstitution come up in our lives, he helps us see through them and gradually understand ourselves. So I don't know about you, but every time Baba teaches me, and sometimes I've been a jerk, he always is so gentle. When, you know, when, when I'm working with Baba, it's never like shaming. It's never, um, you know, like, I mean, it's me that can go into the shame or can go into the, the horror when I really see it. But, but then he forgives me, of course, but it's, it's, it's always so gentle. So that's the first thing I wanted to share. And sometimes stuff will come to me in a dream or, um, or, you know, in the lagoon cabin or elsewhere, even in the lagoon cabin in my mind or some samadhi in my mind now. But um, the other thing is, I love the last sentence here. His love sustains us and becomes the primary force working through us. So to me, first of all, I do feel his love, but also it's working through us. And I know those if you know those, um, yeah, I really feel that. I really, you know, and I feel it with other Baba lovers, but, uh, but I know when I clear myself through whatever I'm, I'm going through or working on and go back to Baba, then that love flows. And I'm able to be, you know, I'm able to be much, a much more loving human being. So anyway, I wanted to share that. Yeah. Beautiful, <clears throat> Larisse. Uh, oh, well, let me respond to what Janet said. This is one of the things that, um, you know, I Darwin was very proactive about it. When you, when you get a block in yourself and you're not able to receive that love, that block is a can become a gift to be given to Baba. I mean, you're stuck with it. You have to work with this, but it can be seen as something that if there's gradually bits and pieces of it, if it can be given to Baba, 
<clears throat> maybe a little flow will happen, but maybe it won't. But that work that you do makes it makes you that much receptive, more receptive next time. <clears throat> but that he was very big on giving things to, to Baba. And the, whatever you give to Baba, the layer of that you give to him is gone forever. But there's another layer just behind it. It looks like the one you gave him. We'll give him that one. But it's like peeling an uh, onion away. <clears throat> but it doesn't seem like you're making any uh, progress. But I think you'll find that, you know, like, like Darwin used to encourage us that Baba is enjoying this process. You are giving chunks of yourself to him. And, and he always said that makes more room for him to live in you. So you're creating space for him to live in you by giving any, anything that's taking up space in you <clears throat> is taking up, uh, is, ta is robbing him of the space that he can uh, enjoy in being in you. So it's a nice exchange. And you'd, Darwin used to say, you'd like to give and Bob a fresh bouquet of roses, but it may be just not, you know, anxiety, or it may be boredom, it may be whatever, and they mean the world to Baba when you give it to him. But it's not going to happen instantly, and suddenly the dam breaks and, and the, the grace flows. Suddenly, yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, now we've got some hands, and Rosalie? Yeah, here's another word that has really hit me, present day. As issues or matters that require reconstitution come up in our lives. I mean, if we are not a, in, a, uh, in the whole mess of reconstitution in our country even. So imagine you know, it's such an opportunity for our lives now, our little separate lives, because our whole country is totally challenged. I mean, this is reconstitution time, you know. I mean, our, we're a constitutional country. Yeah, we're blown out of the water right now. So, Bob, I, 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 uh, I thought of that. I thought, boy, I better repeat Baba's name even more nowadays, <laughs> you know, anyway. J. Baba. Yeah, J. Baba. Yeah. <laughs> and Elizabeth Robinson. Oh, it's very interesting because I was thinking of the same word, reconstitution. But I, my my question was, well, what do we really mean by reconstitution? And um, I I guess from based on what uh, Jeff just said and what Ros Rosalie said, sounds like it's creating space by letting things that aren't real inside of us go so that it allows things that are more real to come in, which are closer to Baba. But if anybody has some further insight, I would like to hear what they're saying about reconstitution. But it also sounds like it's a process that always goes on and that the power that he, his power, Baba's power, power of truth, the sword of truth slays that falseness. And part of that is, it says all finitehood and limitations are subjective and self-created. So the self-imposition of limitations, I guess because of sanskaras. But if anyone has any other ideas to further elucidate reconstitution, that would be great. We'll probably get that question answered. And Heidi, go ahead. Yeah, I was listening to Larice and um, her experience of the gentleness of Baba. And I've certainly experienced that. But I just wanted to mention, I'm sure all of you have, I've also experienced the opposite, <laughs> where I felt Baba was pulling my heart out of my chest because I was probably holding on so tightly to the sanskaras I wasn't aware of that he just he was helping me and I was like ah so we go through a lot of that too <laughs> and uh 
it's uh, it's just refreshing to have the, this group and, and to feel the support. Um, and uh, I just wanted to mention it because uh, I guess I see pain and, and angst and, and heartache and upset and challenges is also part of the path. And um, not just intellectual bl blessings, but if you embrace them with Baba, you could see the light. And as you experience the darkness for a while, you could still see Baba, you know, the Baba's light and him dissolving the darkness. But it's so important to experience it so we can relate to others too. So that's all I wanted to say. Yeah. Thank you, Heidi. Yeah. <clears throat> respond to what Elizabeth said, you know, say uh, you're leading an ordinary worldly life and then, then suddenly you get interested in spirituality and Baba. Now you have to, your life gets reconstituted where it was entirely worldly, just ordinary life. Now you've got this, this spiritual quest going on. And so everything has to be reconstituted, reoriented to that new approach. But then even then, you can go along and you're now moving toward Baba, but you had, say, a, a feeling of unworthiness from childhood. But you kind of work through that, that uh, complex. And so you get to reconstitute yourself in a different way. You know, you've kind of moved out of, of certain limitations and you have to get reconstituted again or reintegrated at a, at a, a deeper level. So it goes on and on. Um, but that's kind of how I have seen it, yeah. Hey. Ruth, you had your hand up briefly. You changed your mind? Well, the dictionary has restore to the original for reconstitution. So for me, that means that I, will, I am in the process of being restored to the one reality, my origin. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Good. And Rosalie? I, I have to say again, you know, it, it, it has several words for reconstitute in the dictionary, you know, uh, reconstruct. I mean, that's a big deal, reconstruct. So I, I think uh, for me personally, other Canada looks bit mighty tempting to be in because they don't have our uh, present uh, group sanskaras, you know. We, you know, we have a big group sanskaric thing happening here. And so this reconstitution, so it's true, it's helping us speed up our process of getting rid of things, I mean, Mega, mega. And I always, you know, I think back all the, the kindness and the patience of the Mandali, so generous, so generous, that almost like preparing us for the future, really, you know, or the present, call it the present, because uh, Baba spilled blood on our country. He said he had to spill it here. That's not that's no small thing. And he said uh, also that we would lead the world. Maybe you know when he said that, Jeff. I don't know when, but I know he, we will lead the world spiritually, but first we will have to be awakened. Yeah, I would say so. Yeah, yeah. And this is such a, an awakening, you know. But uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a serious time. And I think because it's such a serious time, more humor is needed, is necessary, you know? Because humor, I remember my first introduction to Baba was a don't worry, be happy card. That is so humorous, you know? It's like, don't worry, be happy. But I mean, he just exudes humor. So you know you were in for a, mega change not a little change reconstitution <laughs> it's not you know and i i think you know certain points in time for us this particular point in time i remember bow used to say 
whether you want it or you don't want it, you get it. So, so we want it. <laughs> Fortunately, we want it, but still, uh, uh, what does everyone else do that's getting it? Like, I, I know that thing of, uh, like when Baba speaks, doesn't he say someone will feel like it's like a serpent in their room that's going to, you know, bite them and kill them. Another will run out in the rain and, you know, with their arms up to receive it. And it's so interesting because, uh, uh, you know, I, I just think of such an intensity of time now, you know, it's like, well, you know, it's, uh, it's, really like an earthquake time now. So anyway, I'm grateful for that thinking all the time. Just give it to Baba, give it to Baba. But I still think about it too. <laughs> Thank you, Rosalie. <laughs> Mayor Prasad, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> to me, the reconstitution is about uh, gradually finding out and understanding who we are you know, changing the perception of who we are. Um, you know, one of the examples I have is, you know, the, you know, when I was a child and I was growing up, I had this perception that I, you know, I'm not capable of loving Baba. And over time, you know, Baba gradually brought up situations where, you know, I, I could, uh, I changed the perception and uh, knew that I'm, I'm capable of loving him or capable of, uh, you know, being able to love him uh, and things like that. So we have these perceptions of ourselves that are wrong over a period of time that we have built up and changing that is what is happening all the time. Beautiful, yeah. We are growing whether we are aware of it or not. As I've said before, Baba's uh, method was two steps forward, one step back. Two steps forward, one step back. <clears throat> you go forward in progress, and then you uh, run into your son's scars. Then you move, and, and Eric used to say, or Baba, you know, that as you're going along, your pride of progress is getting annihilated at the same time as you are moving uh, along spiritually. <clears throat> Okay. We're on page 14, the master's constant presence. Uh, one of the major inner stances we need to adopt is that of letting love flow while not getting caught up in our current scenario. It is all a passing show. Love is the only real thing that is happening. Our constant becomes the connection with the master at the center of our being. Then at a lower level, the illusory world is passing by. I feel that we must make efforts to withdraw our attention from all of the illusory happenings more and more so that we can remain steadfast in a constant relationship with the master within. When he was in his physical form, Baba assured us that with his infinite consciousness, he would be with us always, wherever we were, whatever we were doing, so that our actions would not have a binding effect on us. Naturally, we are not going to purposely do things that would be wrong. This assurance was to give us an inner sense of detachment from illusion, replacing it with his love and presence. Beloved Baba's living presence is something we can have with us all the time by thinking of him, focusing on him with love, and trying to love him more and more. Ultimately, we will be doing this anyway. We will be funneled into that position where we will love God completely with all our heart. And the sooner we can get to that point, the sooner we will be free from the unnecessary suffering of all the opposites. Yeah, I was, uh, the uh, part about getting funneled, uh, it reminds me of that uh, um, story of if you're in a riverbed and you're going downstream, you're going this, you bounce against that bank and then you keep on going now so you bounce against that against that bank and then you bounce against the other bank going back and forth but you're going downstream you eventually end up in the ocean so the thing about getting funneled really really struck me as uh, as appropriate uh, even if we fail it's seemingly for the moment and what we're 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 doing the fact that we're trying to get downstream we're eventually getting there 
Thanks. Yeah. And Rosalie again. Uh, it's so funny. I, I kind of feel a bit charged up today. I think it was probably uh, 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 thinking of Espandiar. <laughs> you know, uh, it was just so fearless, you know. Anyway, but I, I thought of something strong that Baba said, just from the, these couple of words here, one of the major inner stances we need to adopt is that of letting love flow while not getting caught up in our current scenario. Well, that's a hard one for me anyway. And then it goes, it is all a passing show. Love is the only real thing that is happening. And Baba's words through Norena from a long time ago, I repeat them uh, to even strangers. Love makes fast progress through its unbroken action of divine life, light. May her Baba. And that helps me because it's unbroken. So everything is as it should be. It's, it's really hard to accept for me, but that I can accept it in that line somehow. You know, it just seems that's right. And then when I share it with other people, it's because I want to hear it myself again. You know, unbroken yeah. action. Yeah. Bye -bye. Bye -bye. Thank you. Um, you know, Dar Dharma was talking about focusing inwardly on Baba, have our focus inward, but we've got this world out in front of us. And, you know, what he says is the way to stay unattached to the world is to be, give your wholehearted love to it. You don't, love doesn't, doesn't get trapped. It, it doesn't get bound. So we are going to have to respond to many situations. Uh, and by giving our love to it <clears throat> wholeheartedly, we actually, oddly enough, we remain detached. Love keeps us detached, even though we're giving, you know, wholeheartedly to something. Uh, when you when you give uh, some your yourself wholeheartedly to something, and someone takes that away, the object of your wholeheartedness, you just move your wholeheartedness to something else. That can't. There's a certain detachment that's intrinsic to wholeheartedness, wholehearted love. That that's another way of looking at wait, wait 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 jeff i didn't follow what you just said your your attachment goes from one thing to the other or your uh, that last sentence that you said no say you you you're wholehearted about your garden you know and you you you're uh, and you what you pour into a wholehearted love to that and suppose a, a hurricane comes along wipes out your garden <clears throat> Uh, you can, uh, or you may, uh, or, or you may have to move. You can use that wholeheartedness. The, the the object of your wholeheartedness can be taken, but the wholeheartedness you can use and and uh, and focus it on something else. In other words, there's a kind of intrinsic uh, detachment from a loving wholeheartedness. But I'll. I'll um, We'll, we'll get into that as the book goes along. Yeah. <laughs> There's some hands up. And Anthony, go ahead. Well, Jeff, that's beautiful. I, I was just thinking about that the other day, too. Mickey Singer had said something one time to us. He was saying, guys, love is not an emotion. He said, love is who you are and what reality is. The other things are emotions and uh, you know I was just feeling that the other day of how like love does like automatically have that kind of transcendental detached quality from it, it or to it and it's yeah I don't know it's such a funny thing it, I feel like mm -hmm. it's so far beyond my understanding that it's you know just thinking in past years of like all these yogic techniques people teach to be you know transcendental and this and that and 
get into these like spaces where it's like, oh, you're in this other state of consciousness, transcendental. And, and it turns out that like love is the thing that gives that quality of kind of like not being mixed up in the world and being in this like other place where the world starts to look, you know, kind of like a little show. Um, yeah, yeah, it's it's amazing. I guess that ties into what I, I was going to say here. I, I just loved um, where Darwin says, our constant becomes the connection with the master at the center of our being. Then at a lower level, the illusory world is just passing by. And he had said something in another passage that was more toward the end of how we, we just work on our connection with Baba and then we let everything at the level of the world just be what it is and just kind of go on and we're not really concerned with it anymore. We just work on our relationship with him. I'm not saying it quite the right way. He said something like that level kind of just takes care of itself or we're, we're just not really mixed in with that anymore um you know so yeah yeah it's just beautiful how the relationship with baba and, and the love just kind of takes us out of that whole level of the world and you know the, all the mix-ups and all the craziness yeah hopefully i said that the right way yeah beautiful i mean if you took away uh eclipse drums i mean what would he be <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, Thea? I think, so and this is a practice that I find such a, a challenge with in some ways because at a certain point it occurred to me that um, what I thought of as loving was not necessarily truly loving. Sometimes, um, uh, Jeff and I have talked about this in terms of uh, the example he uses is sometimes a mom will like grab a child's arm and yell at them to um, keep them from running into the road. And it seems like a rough and a violent thing and not loving, but it's actually deeply loving. And I've recently um, uh, had conflict with a roommate who ended up moving out over this. We've had ongoing and escalating conflict. And in this most recent case, they were, um, well, in, in all of the cases, it was boundaries established by people and well explained within the household regarding um, either how they were addressing guests um, and treating people or that entered the house or um, engagement with the house. And this most recent one was uh, specifically COVID safety precautions. Um, and after like extended days of trying to like, um, you know, handle things with nonviolent communication and like feelings talk and express, you know, multiple meetings and that kind of thing, there was just a complete disregard for all of the stuff we the other roommates had talked about with him. And it fell on me to have um, the conversation because of the timing of things. And I ended up trying gently and then escalating and then escalating and then finally like yelled in his face, um, which is probably hard for most of you who've known me most of my life to imagine, um, but like full like screamed in someone's face. Um, and I remember before that, like literally walking away and talking to Baba being like, I don't know what you expect from me, Baba. Like I have been trying so hard and so hard to like manage this. And I don't know how to do it. I'm like giving my anger to you. I'm giving my frustration to you. I am talking about this and he's not listening. And then he just like, the, the guy did the thing. And I, and I like stopped and I'm like, I have to go yell at him, don't I? And it was just like this, like, yep. And I turned around and went and yelled at him. And I don't, I've never in this had hatred for him. And I've never felt angry at him for it. For it. But I have been trying to be loving through all of it. And even that like yelling in his face was meant with the intention and hope that 
okay, like maybe this is not going to work out living together. But what if this is what like gets him to stop doing this to other people and he doesn't like do this in a worse way? Like what if this is what helps him grow? Um, and I would like to say that I feel free of it, but there is some level of me that is still not happy that I yelled at him and wishes that there was a different way to deal with it. And I can't figure out if that is me that's putting that on or if that's a naggling thing from Baba to be like, you should go do this or you know that there's an alternative. And um, so it's both, there, it's like I'm both experiencing this and not experiencing this in that circumstance. It's like, it's interesting I had this section to read, right? Because this is the, the idea of trying to do everything from a loving position is where I was coming at with it um, and what I was trying to do. But I don't, you know, it's like until I guess we are perfect, we will do these things imperfectly. I don't have a point necessarily to this, but it's- No, um, no. <clears throat> yeah. that's the spiritual life right there. <laughs> Those dilemmas, trying to find the right way to thread the, thread the needle. Yeah. No, excellent. Yeah, and Heidi. Yeah, um, this conversation, Jeff, you just saved me when you talked about <laughs> wholeheartedness as detachment, because. Um, <clears throat> I have, I think, I've been criticized my whole life for throwing myself into something wholeheartedly, and I'm not enmeshed in it. And I don't, I couldn't explain it to people, and you articulated it for me, uh, and, and I love it. Um, and it's so freeing. But I think, and when Theo was talking, I was thinking to myself, um, when I've had moments of yelling at other people, uh, it's a, it's different when I did it years ago uh, and I felt really bad about it. And then I, when I look back on it, I wasn't really wholeheartedly there when I did it. But when I've been wholeheartedly there, I could feel, almost feel Baba pushing it with a purpose. And it's it heals and it's, it balances out like quickly. I'm not afraid. I'm not shocked. But, you know, so I guess the trick is to just be wholehearted, throw yourself into everything you're doing with love. And you'll come out on the other side free. You know, I don't think a lot of people understand that because, you know, sometimes I even get called codependent. I said, what are you talking about? That is not good. <laughs> you know, it, it's just being there to be here now fully. And you're there in consciousness and you're handling things because Bob is handling it, really, you know, and then you can end it and move on to the next one. Like you were saying, it does work. I mean, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> yeah, sure. <clears throat> That's what the Mondali were always <clears throat> kind of pushing that approach. Okay. Elizabeth Robinson. Yeah, I was, uh, this is similar to what several of you have said, but um, uh, I think it's the, the importance of love being different from emotions has become clearer and clearer to me the older I get, because I think I used to really confuse them. And one of the things I learned within the past couple years that I probably should have known, but was when um, someone, um, was when you get hurt, very, very, very deeply hurt, betrayed by someone you love. And it makes you extremely sad and extremely angry, but at the same time, you still love them. It's so super hard to do. And uh, Baba helped me to be able to do that with this particular person and, um, I suppose it, uh, I knew that I would feel terrible about myself if I could not continue to love because I was also grateful to this person. Um, and, um, but it just showed me how difficult love, true love, well, 
the love that I think Baba would want me to have actually is. Um, and even today with a friend, I experienced something similar and was trying to be somewhat detached. Um, someone I'd made angry and I had no earth, I was oblivious. And of course that made me feel terrible because this is a good friend. And um, you know, you wonder, well, why am I not more conscious? But at the same time, I understood, which I wouldn't have understood a few years ago, that this person also needed to have some new insights in how to be with another person. Um, but I, I did not get upset. I did have a feeling of detachment. And I think it's because I knew more than I used to know, even though it was still difficult um, Anyway, all I'm trying to say is that I think love is hard. <laughs> it's <No>. not easy <laughs> the way I thought it was. And it's not the same as emotions. But yep. emotions can be a attached to whoever it is that's the focus of, of that love at that of a particular love, but not the bigger love. I don't know if I made myself yeah. clear, but that's what I was trying. I'm trying to say something, and I think I did not. But anyway. No, that uh, just to comment here. Um, am I audible? I can't. Yeah, yeah. That distinction between emotions and feelings from love is a very invaluable distinction uh, to get it experientially. You know, even Baba says a lot of feelings and emotions are the creation of mind and energy. Love is the creation of the soul. So they're coming from different directions. But uh, to be able to make that distinction is, I feel, very helpful in moving deeper into the heart. <clears throat> you know, they have a different vibration, so to speak. <clears throat> anyway, yeah. Uh, well, God, this is a wonderful, wonderful con uh, conversation. I was looking at the last section um, and I had a question and it sort of got answered in this session. So I just thought I would share my feelings about it. It was um, where he says, all finitehood and limitations are subjective and self-created. So that was the part about when he was talking about reconstituting. And I asked the question, well, what do I need Baba to reconstitute in me? And, um, you know, I can it's good to go deep and get words for it. Um, like belief systems is sort of what I came up with, certain beliefs I may have about myself. Um, but then there comes the question, well, how, do, how does that happen? I mean, yes, give it to Baba consciously, um, but I can't really fix it in myself, it seems. Um, so I have to let him do it. How do I do it? Then I went to this section where it said, letting love flow while not getting caught up in our current scenario. So I thought it's almost like I open it up to him, all the pain, all that, all the suffering and, you know, lifetimes perhaps, and let the love flow through it because that's all I can do. I can't really change it myself. But if I ask him to help. Yeah. We'll do it. So true. Thanks. Yeah. And Doris? Yeah, I had a difficult situation the other day where um, I'm in an organization where I'm supposed to, there's supposed to be communication with the team and, and there hasn't been because um, the person at the top doesn't want to. And um, Anyway, when we finally talked, the person just kind of went on a rampage about my character. And um, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, I'm that. Um, and the gift of this is that my alcoholic mother did this in my teenage years, a lot of this. Who do you think you are, Lady Jane, and all this other stuff? You know, you think you're this, and you think you're that, and, you know, it's very sick. Um, and even though I was triggered, um, and I've worked on the trigger, 
um, and it was it was difficult. It was difficult. It was painful. I did speak up for myself, and I really could clearly see because of my because of Baba that really it doesn't matter what anybody thinks of me. It's what Baba thinks of me, and um, and that it was a gift. I think it was. It, I think this is a Baba gift because I haven't been able to. You know, I haven't really addressed this part of my childhood with Baba. I haven't, I haven't been like thinking about it, but boy, it's in my face now, right? Because I've got, I've got the same situation. So whether Baba attract that to me or whether I unconsciously with my son Scar has attracted this person so that that stuff could come up and I could give it to Baba. So first of all, I thought about giving the person to Baba. And this morning I woke up and I heard Baba say to me, you haven't forgiven the person. Um, but what I did, let's see, yesterday when I was talking to someone about it, I got through to compassion because uh, the, my, my friend said to me, you know, unless someone is sort of on a, a growth path, a lot of people right now are in addictions, you know, and I think this person is actually quite isolated. You know, I'm in this loving community here with Baba Lovers. I have several other really loving communities and supportive communities. And I can't even imagine what it is to be completely isolated during this time. And, or maybe active with some addiction, you know, I mean, who knows? I mean, it, I, it doesn't matter, but um, obviously that if, you know, if we're blaming other people for stuff and you know, cutting down their character, the person's in pain. So I got to, to some compassion to that. And then this morning, Bob was like, you know, an, another layer, I've got to forgive the person. But what I'm seeing from here also is I can make a choice to be loving. I can make a choice to be, you know, there's, I'm always being given the choice to be loving in a situation. Um, it's hard when my stuff is really triggered, but I can come around with Baba and, uh, and choose to be loving and choose to see the Baba in that person. Sometimes it takes a few days. Um, and, you know, um, anyway, this is my situation right now. I'm, there's no, no comment on anything that anybody else said. I think everybody's just like Baba has a unique relationship with each of us. I think we all have, you know, our lessons with Baba that are unique and, um, so it's just me sharing my my experience right now. Just thinking that this is perfect, Baba. Baba set up this really challenging situation for me to to grow and to heal more on that old stuff that I wasn't really thinking about at all for like a number of years. Thanks. Beautiful, Maurice. We we all have been there. <laughs> yeah, uh, Diane. Hi, um, it, I was thinking when Thea was talking about getting somebody to not run into traffic and also confronting the roommate, it reminds me when, I know this is gonna sound silly, but when we first started training our dog like 30 years ago and you had to use a forceful tone without being angry and it was actually the best graduate program for when we had a child because when we had to tell our daughter, um, like, you know, kind of like, don't touch that stove when it's hot, you have to, you have to use that forceful in your face scare, kind of like jerk them, almost slap them with the energy, but not with anger. And that, that was something that I had to work on really, really strongly so that it would come from love and not from anger. So I, that was all yeah. to me. Perfect, beautiful, Diane. Yeah, I just to <clears throat> introduce here the the Mondali were big on what they call mock anger. You know, where you you get your point across, but you're not re you you don't become angry. You're just expressing anger, but you're not being angry. But it's hard to do that. It's 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 an art. And, and uh, you know, yeah, great. It was uh, for, for Thea mentioned that thing. 
uh, the problem is very, very difficult. And then I was sort of in the way of thinking of, of, of what Diane just, just said. Uh, you have to, uh, before you get to the point of getting angry, if you know some point has to get across, and this is with my kids again, you would, you would like have a point where you would raise your voice and be stern. And I'm pretty sure that that's what my mom and dad did with me. I can only see it now. And uh, because then you're, you're just doing something has to be said, but you're not angry. And it reminds me of, uh, I'm reading Erich's book, That's How It Happened, that, That's How It Was. And he recounts the Monoly uh, saying that, the, the point, the passage uh, about uh, you, you, you might, or Baba told the story about you might have to hiss in order to like keep someone away or someone um, uh, in in a place that you're you're more comfortable with. So you're getting angry and you're hissing just to stop things where where they are. Uh, this was for the I don't know if it if it helps any any anyone else. Thanks. Uh, hiss, but don't strike. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Janet. Yeah, this is this is kind of piggybacking what Thea said and also what Jeff said. I mean, or what was being said about love being distinct from emotions. And how that helps me is that is that this notion that even if you do use this the hissing or even maybe borderline into striking sometimes, it it may doesn't necessarily it doesn't it's a different thing than the love so the love is 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 an is is a different energy like you were saying jeff it's it's something from the soul and so that soul energy um you know i don't know but it's just it's a great distinction for me to to yeah. to, to see that to to kind of have a uh, a rudimentary, I guess, at this point, grasp. I mean, even maybe I've heard it before, but it's 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 sinking in a little more deeply. And so, yeah, thank you for that. Yeah, beautiful. <clears throat> and Hugh Flick. So Rosalie uh, reminded us that Thanksgiving is coming up, and in this section that uh, we're. Darwin says, beloved Baba's living presence is something we can have with us all the time. It reminded me, uh, thinking of Thanksgiving, reminded me of some of the things that I associate with uh, uh, listening to Darwin uh, talk about his life with Baba and things. And the two things that uh, uh, struck me uh, uh, with that are from this uh, sentence in this section, uh, Baba's companionship that Jeff has uh, talked about a lot. And the other thing that uh, Jeff has mentioned uh, uh, quite often is the gratitude. And in terms of Thanksgiving, uh, part of the, uh, my particular sadhana, my, my particular spiritual practice is thanking Baba. Uh, Baba uh, says uh, to think of him uh, while you're uh, doing things. The way I do that is to thank him uh, as part of uh, uh, my working out, whatever that thing is. Beautiful. Yeah, gratitude is one of the divine qualities. So you're touching base with the, the deepest part of, of us. And, and that comes directly from Baba. Yeah. Was Diane before? So um, I think um, personally for myself, when I'm feeling Bubba's love, it just kind of flows from me without judgment, without emotion, without feeling. It's just this like blissful feeling and it's very settling. It's, it's, I don't even know when it comes. I just know I can, I, I experience it differently than when I think, use my brain and think I'm loving someone versus really the love coming from Baba and not from me. And it feels, to me, it feels really different. If one just like 
my heart just opens up and it's just pouring out. And the other one, I'm thinking, I'm thinking on how to show I love them or show that I love something or it's, it's really feels very, very different. It took a long time for me to be able to know the difference between the two, but um, it's, it's very, very, it's a wonderful thing. is all I can say. Yeah. And I would say very important to be able to be sensitive enough to see the difference because one uh, feelings come from the sun scars and, and love comes from the soul. And even though the, the love can, can hit the feelings and they, you know, they express the love through the feelings, but it's just like the moon. The moon is not the source of its own light. It's coming from the sun, you know, and they get conflated. The higher feelings and love get conflated, you know, anyway. <clears throat> I request a moment of silence. Okay. After which, after which everyone can <laughs> chat freely amongst themselves. J. Baba. Yeah, quick announcement. Uh, Stu did email me saying he's unavailable tonight, so we don't get yeah. the heart-based meditation today. You know, just kind of piggybacking on what Hugh said, I'm, we're coming up to Thanksgiving. And one thing that Mara said very beautifully, she said, if you were to thank Bob for all that he has done for you, your whole life wouldn't be long enough. Hmm. So. <clears throat> beautiful. So you all share so beautifully from your heart. Boy, couldn't ask for more. May I ask Angela a question if she's still here? Yeah, she's there. Angela, is there, speaking of Thanksgiving, are there special programs for Thanksgiving? Well, nothing came together, so we're just going to have our usual Thursday, okay. which is special enough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll be great. <laughs> Any further, um, any questions or anything that <clears throat> that is stirred up that we didn't cover? Jeff, you know, when you said, Mara said we couldn't, you know, we'd be thanking him our, for everything for our whole lives and more. Uh, uh, when people talk about the lottery, I always think, I already won the lottery with Baba, yeah. you know? <laughs> It's more precious than anything, anything ever. Yeah. Yeah. No, that gratefulness is, is growing more and more for people, you know, especially in this, during this pandemic, you know, we have that inner life that just is, is sustaining with Baba. So option. I was just thinking that it, it feels to me perhaps like, I, my my sanskaric bindings get loosened a little bit during these meetings. I mean, you know, the knot is a little less tight than the rest of the week. <laughs> There's the challenge of of remembering and continuing, but but just to have that influx of of support in in that process is that's enough for the whole Thanksgiving day. <laughs> I tell you. beautiful. I have yeah. Yeah, Diane. Terry. Or Terry, either yeah. one. I tell people that I have everything I need and want in my life. I don't, other than food, and I mean, I, I do love traveling, but other than that, I don't really, I feel so satisfied in so many ways. And when that disappears, when I feel like I need or want something, I know it's more of Bubba and I just have to get back into that place with him. 
and yeah. the the desires to want things just seem to go away. Yeah, beautiful. So true. I oh. I like to share like what a difference a week makes, and last week this time I was you know before like just crippled with pain and uh, that delusion of separateness and the uh, just as things have unfolded I'm I am feel very tender for the fact that this experience of illusion is not a bad one it's like what else do we have to do with all of the infinite time and space but to go through this great game of forgetting that we're infinite and remembering and to have gone through the forgetting process last week very intensely and just like what Darwin said when we're locked into our misconceptions and imprisoned by our perception of who we are what we are and what creation is you know that's what keeps us so bound and um it's so it's easy to say that but having gone through that so much of that in such a visceral way in the last week and knowing that Baba is my only income my only at least at the level that I happen to be right now there's such a lightness with it and still the necessity I'm so grateful for the conversation towards the end of tonight to make a stand on the truth within like loving everyone and everything doesn't mean that you're not strong and you don't say enough to what feels like very um, hurtful or you know type of behavior and in when, when I finally found that voice to say enough is that all the the kind of boo-hooing and attachments went away because I was keeping myself small. Mm -hmm. I was keeping myself small in some idealized notion of love doesn't look like having the dignity of a, a spark of all that is God that matters too. So I'm very grateful yeah. um, for this whole process and for how Baba takes us through and takes me through in the palm of his hand through like the seeming guttural pain of, you know, oblivion and into the bliss of reunion. Beautiful. And Beautiful. Cindy, can you share what your insight was today at the uh, meditation that Roshni did? It was focused on the sixth reality, but. Um, um, well, that, that reality, well, the fifth reality is the one about that we have to, um, their only real knowledge is that God is the indweller and in all so-called good and so, so-called bad. And if you ever find yourself in a dispute, I mean, welcome to earth to be able to be in that without enmity and hatred. And um, so I'm going through a divorce. So like that mm -hmm, uh, enmity and hatred is, you know, like a tagline for a lot of that. And to be, to still keep being in compassion and love for such a long period of time but what I found is that um, enmity and hatred doesn't mean that I'm some weak victim consciousness that just keeps taking and taking. And that when I feel that way, I'm keeping myself small. I'm keeping myself separate. Like Baba says that we are infinite. So why do we feel helpless? And, you know, to attach onto anything else. So those are kind of the subjects, you know, going through, but it's, it was a wonderful realization this week in this wow. yeah wow it's wonderful to see what baba does in in our lives like we've got a front row seat <laughs> in this you know in you know the uh, one thing that the last message you and I, i'm sure most all of you know the last message baba gave on the alphabet board he talked about internal links mm -hmm. not only just the link with him but with each other so at an inner level or even an external level, we are supporting each other in ways that we don't even, may not even be conscious of, but that is happening. So we're, 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 not, we're not alone because Bob is there, but we're not alone because we have <clears throat> all these people, <clears throat> uh, these links of love with so many people. <clears throat> Jeff. Uh... I wanted to share a couple of lines from uh, Manly, Palmer Ball, Manly Palmer Hall's book, The Secret Destiny of America, because it's so apropos about Thanksgiving. Uh, Nostradamus refu ref refers to the country under several names, and one of them is America. 
uh, it says, um, and his third designation of it is the land which keeps the Thursday, which I think is so interesting because in India, it's Guru Day, special day. Anyway, and then it goes, and we keep Thursday. It's the only holiday that we have to celebrate on Thursday. There's no other one. You know, New Year's Eve is switched. All those other ones move around. Um, well, Christmas Day moves. You know, it's always the 25th, but it moves. Anyway, and then it says, this last form is the most astonishing, the ones that keep Thursday. For it refers to the unique American holiday, Thanksgiving, which always falls on a Thursday. And this is the only holiday which depends upon the day alone for its observance and is peculiarly the American holiday which expresses thankfulness for freedom of religion, freedom of opportunity, and freedom of life. And anyway, uh, this book is fascinating, um, but uh, you know, I do feel, especially because Baba spilled blood and he said it had to be in America. It's a, just such a big deal and he allowed Mary to share it. He was very careful about people not even saying anything that would upset Mary. And he lets her come over here and share this accident. It's tremendous, tremendous uh, uh, offering, you know. I mean, but especially for us here, because, you know, it's like where, where the bomb strikes the most forces, you know, the right in the middle of our country, you know, I mean, think of it. Anyway, I think we have a lot to be grateful for, but it requires a lot of reconstitution. <laughs> ah, yep. Thank you. Anyone else? Anything that comes up? Ah, I see Mahu has arrived <laughs> from California. Yeah. Yes, Jeff. Thank you, Jay Baba. Yeah, Jay Baba. <laughs> well, wait. You know My what? My camera doesn't work, so I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um. You know, have we? Uh, oh, is Farish Day here still or not? Oh. She's here. Hey, could you could you read a um a hafiz for us? Um, or not? You're, no, no pressure. <laughs> I was actually in the middle of something else, but I can go fetch one if you really want one. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll um, keep ourselves uh, busy until you find. Let's hope she reads number 20. She does. <laughs> number 20? You really want that number? I or is it 22? 20. Somebody said 22 was special. 22. <laughs> 22. Okay. okay, 22. I'll go for 22. Maybe I'm mixed up. Yeah. Today is the 22nd as well. Oh, yeah. well, and there you go. It's Baba. <laughs> and uh, these, these are, <clears throat> these poems are like a, a message from eternity in a way. Hafez is buried deep. She, she's been, she, he's been ignored. Oh, Baba, where did you go? Okay, here we go. Number 22, it is. Okay, it is from the garden of union with you that the garden of paradise gets its water. I think you guys spoke about paradise today and the garden of Eden. 
So it is from the garden of union with you that the garden of paradise gets its water. It is from the agony of separation from you that the fire of hell gets its heat. Since the tears of my eyes are a river flowing in the garden of Eden every night, they see your blissful eyes in dreams. Heaven and paradise both have taken shelter in your beauty and your height. Good things come to those who are good. Spring has described your beauty with each season. Heaven has recited your loveliness in each station. The barbecued hearts of your lovers have earned and are yearning for the seasoning salt of your mouth and lips. This raw heart of mine burned, but mm -hmm. did not reach its desire. This raw heart of mine burned, but did not reach its desire. If it had reached its goal, it would not bleed, be bleeding still. Don't think that your lovers are intoxicated around you. You have no clue about the condition of the corrupt ascetics. Having gone around your lip, it has become evident for me that the essence of wine manifests only when the sun shines upon the world. Do not let life be spent in vain, Hafez. Strive and discover the precious fruit of your existence. Mm -hmm. Jay Meher Baba. Boy, thank you. Well, lovely. Jay Baba. You, you bring uh, Hafez right to our doorstep. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Any other, anything else that? <clears throat> was that line that heaven has recited your loveliness? Was that one of the lines in there? Uh, well, it says heaven and paradise both have taken shelter in your beauty and your height, your stature. Good things come to, to those who are good. Beautiful. Mm. Can you read that last line one more time? Do not let life be spent in vain, Hafez. Strive and discover the precious fruit of your mm -hmm. existence. That's a good translation. Yeah, her translations are very comprehensible intellectually so that you can imbibe them within the heart, with the heart. Yeah. And soul. Are they are they somewhere where we can read them other than you're having them first, Ty? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could I could use to read that whole thing again on a regular basis is what I'm oh, really trying to say. Well, you know, I I'm guilty of not working on them. I'm supposed to be working at least one half as a week, if not two or three. And I've kind of diverged into other things like art. Um, it's all Jeff's fault because he doesn't encourage me. <laughs> no, I do. <laughs> okay, fair I say, I'm going to start calling you once a week and I won't quit. No. You know doesn't I won't quit. <laughs> I have to stop watching. Um, I think I'm done with all the latest brouhaha of politics i'm done yeah let it be let it happen whatever i have no control over any of it anyway yeah so hey, well, let's, uh, <clears throat> i took Thursday. shelter in art <clears throat> what a uh, first day how about reading 20 for larry pesta all yeah. right <clears throat> okay wait, wait can you and, just say that one i'm trying to write down that line honey i will send it to you 
She'll Thank send you. it to you. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, Farishta, yeah. one of the things is that you, uh, before uh, you read a guzzle, uh, you you put a question before. Yes. Before Hoff is or before God. You can. That's an option. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Or you can just read for the pure pleasure of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, Larry, what is your question on for Gazal twenty? Uh, I like it. It's one. It's a beautiful. No, the twenty I'm about to read. You're supposed to ask a question of Hafez, and he'll answer it for you. Like how? What do I need to do in my life about this or that? Okay. Or whatever. What? Um, oh, I can't think of a question. Oh, uh, the man with no questions is a man who has arrived. Oh God, I have not done that. Um, <laughs> my question is: um, Does your book publisher force you to write more hafiz every day? <laughs> Actually, I'm so bad. I've gotten two editing projects going on right now. So I'm editing other people's books rather than writing my own. So my question to Hafiz would, what should I concentrate on spiritually for the mm -hmm. next week? Okay. Avatar Meher Baba Ki Jai. Okay. By the grace of Allah, what fortune I possess tonight. Because my beloved suddenly came to me tonight. I prostrated as soon as I saw his beautiful face. Thank God I have good deeds to my credit tonight. The seedling of my patience for union has borne fruit tonight. I have finally received my great fortune tonight. Way to go, Larry. I have won the royal lottery. My awakened destiny has arrived into my hands tonight. I love this translation. <laughs> With an unstoppable self-perpetuating determination. I'm taking off the veil of ignorance tonight. Like Mansur's blood that wrote, I am God after his death. I too will do the same if you kill me tonight. I am the deserving one. You have the blessings. Give a well-deserved Tithe, I am agreeable tonight. I am afraid Hafez may be annihilated from the bliss I am experiencing tonight. Wasn't that one that he wrote on the night of realization, right? That's one of them. This is, yeah. this is what you write about on the night of your realization. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Well, uh, we'll talk to you next week, Larry, on Sunday and see how it went. It's not, it sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Excellent. You better get a new uh, set of clothes, Larry, and be prepared. I'm going shopping tonight. <laughs> <laughs> well, you have all the blessings. So it'll probably too. Maybe really other well. people did, too. So we'll see what happens next week. <laughs> yeah. We want a full report. <laughs> Oh, wow. That is so, thank you, Ferris Day. That's just, oh, heartrending. So I have a question for the uninitiated. Yeah. Can you, Ferris Day, you, I, I, I'm, I, I, you translate Hafiz? Yes. And it's right. publishable that we could, like, I know, how do uh, we get your interpretations? Yes, I have done about 100 of them, give or take, 100, 120. I'd like to finish the whole thing before publishing them. Um, there's about 500 more. <laughs> <clears throat> but, you know, I mean, the Baba lovers do 
do want this. So maybe I'll, I'll publish the first phase one um, yeah. next year. Yeah, volume one. Volume yeah. one. Yeah. Do, do, do five volumes, then they're easy to give away to people mm -hmm. for birthday presents yeah. and things like that. Very true. Yeah. yeah. And we're getting up in age, you know, we may not even be uh, there for the last 300. <laughs> that's, that's just, <laughs> Get that's them out just, soon. That's what I was thinking. I was thinking, will I be alive? <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. <laughs> hey, Christy, what you could do is uh, do a PDF and sell it to us for 20 bucks a piece on, on PayPal or something. And make money right now, electronically, and and get it out to us because oh, I'd love that for twenty five, right. whatever you sell it for. Yeah, yeah. Well, Baba is speaking through you guys, so I will um, I will give it a good good try. Yeah, Jay Baba. No, Jay. because a, a great meditation in, in the morning to read something like that, along with your other morning routine. It's just, it, it comes from, a, it comes in from a different uh, window into the soul. You, you know, they're quite, quite often, almost every day, someone reads a guzzle from Hafez or one of the other um, great writers, Rumi or someone like that. Any other, any other Comments or Ruth? I was just saying good night. Oh, good night, Baba. Yeah. Good night, Ruth. Good night, Baba, everyone. Yeah. Baba, me too. Good night. Thank you all. Good night. I'm leaving too. Che, Bob, everybody. Have a happy yeah. Thanksgiving. Bye bye. Well, happy Thanksgiving. Yeah. Bye, Cindy. Bye, Elizabeth. Yeah, beautiful. Thank See you. you. Thank you, Baba. He gave us a, a wonderful time together. Thank you, Jay Baba. Yeah. Good night, Larise. Good night, Cindy, Jeff, Angela. Yeah. Cindy, my heart goes out to you. Oh, thank you, dear woman. I feel it. Jay Baba. I feel the love. Yeah. Call. Okay. <laughs> We'll see you later tonight, Jeff. Yeah. yeah. You know, there's a line from, I mean, this is a kind of a, a heavy duty line from a, a Sufi <clears throat> saint called Sarmad, where he says, in, in the battle of love, none but the lovers are slain. The weak and wicked escape from injury. <laughs> O oh, you who are the true lover, flee not from the battle. Those who are not killed are dead to love. Mm. So beautiful. Yeah. That reminds me, I watched Moonstruck today. I haven't seen it since it came out in the 80s. And Olivia, Olympia Dukakis says to Cher about Nicolas Cage, she goes, do you love him? And she said, yes. And Olympia Dukakis, Olympia Dukakis said, oh, that's terrible. <laughs> because love will destroy you like love just destroys like it's like when you love someone like that it's going to destroy you but i just love that just yeah. <laughs> it, it's it, it's yeah it's not destroying anything that we <clears throat> really want in the end there's uh Rumi says I, I like it where he says love is the last 30 pound bale mm -hmm. when you load it on the boat tips over <laughs> Who said that ingenious phrase? What's that? Who said that? Rumi. Love is the, is the last 30 pound bale. When you, when you load it on, the boat tips over. <laughs> <laughs> it's like when you go uh, from Bombay to Ahmednagar, they, especially in the past, there were all these huge trucks that were belly up or off to the side of the road. Why? Because they kept piling on more and more on top of the truck, you know, just to make money. And they would get so top heavy and they would go up the, uh, you know, up the mountain. And the th I mean, it was like, it, 
they were kind of right and left. They're just these huge trucks. So that's the last, <clears throat> that's the last two ton uh, uh, bo uh, crate that they added on that uh, finished them off financially. <laughs> well, hey, Alan, are you there? Alan Manukian. Hey, Jeff, what's up? Yeah. Good. <clears throat> Good that you're there. Well, I'll be around tonight if you show up. Uh, it, Alan is really, um, I r thoroughly enjoy listening to him. <clears throat> He's got a, a different camera. Oh, there he is. A different yeah. camera angle. Um, that's, that's very refreshing. I, I totally can, agree. What's that? I totally agree. Yeah. Well, it's good to see you. Uh, I've yeah. been really taking in uh, everybody's everybody's sharing. Uh, as my, I, I, I had to have a cup of coffee here. It's kind of kind of getting sleepy for the, yeah. with all the all the uh, relaxation. Yeah, it's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot of love. I, I so appreciate the, the younger voices too. I mean, in the age of your, your actually human life. And I was talking to my daughter, Michelle, before this, and she was just talking to Linda Hansen and, and they were talking about that, like the, the young Baba lovers and the older Baba lovers. And, and I was just thinking like how wonderful when there's not a division like that, that, that young and old is just different perspectives that have value and we can bridge between those voices and and become you know stronger points of light together like those internal links the, the subtle way that the ego can separate the baba community or the overt ways but that younger voice at least with my children the younger voice and the older voice but just respectful perspectives that make us both grow so i very much appreciate thea and thea i went on your website about your friday night thing and that's really great and that's why i have done the she her sometimes but i didn't really realize that me doing that would help give permission to others to do that until i read your blog and so i have to figure out how to keep it on but i thought oh that just that just made sense to me so that's a voice me coming from you know 55 i think i'm 55 years old like just new in into that even though my youngest is is you know non-binary now too and or not too but he's just you know told me about it so it's just very helpful to have all the different perspectives that bring the puzzle piece together into wholeness so mm. thank you right for, yeah for coming to this forum with this. yeah thea uh, thea has a feeling check-in on fridays at seven on eastern time <clears throat> i used to go on that but then um, i'm not allowed to do the uh, Zoom from the, the center, but uh, we got some good mileage for a while there. <clears throat> also, there's a, I know, just noticed there's a meeting scheduled by Greg Dunn um, on Zoom, and I can tell you when it is, but it's about having difficult conversations. Mm. And he's encouraging people to come together to have those difficult, you know, kind of different yeah. perspectives. I thought that was brilliant. Him and I had talked about doing something like this months ago, but he is—he's uh, doing it. And, and I think, what what kind of what kind of difficult conversations? Um, well, any difficult conversation where there's opposing points of view. Um, so he says yeah. we're ha living in a challenging time in the world generally, in the U.S. in particular. Viewpoints are starkly divided, even among Baba lovers. Baba as but as Baba lovers, we share the huge advantage of being united in our love and reverence for the avatar of the age. If we can't learn to discuss difficult subjects with each other successfully, who will be able to? Let's read some things together that may help us improve our ability to communicate about difficult topics. Then let's practice by trying to discuss some contentious issues. Then let's uh, iterate that process until we really do get better at difficult conversations and so on. Anyway, yeah. about understanding and empathy and so forth, which is what Cindy, you were just talking about. And this applies to a much broader, I think, 
uh, than young, old, you know, it's about diff just different perspectives to come together, to appreciate, listen to without judgment, the other person's point of view and kind of park our own point of view over here so that we can fully listen and hear what the other person is saying without having already, before even they finish, we already have a preconceived notion of <clears throat> what yeah. our, what our point of view should is which is better than theirs of course <laughs> good so i encourage us all to attend this it's going to be um it's going to be november 23rd tomorrow from 4 to 5 30 p.m eastern standard time uh-huh greg don from Asheville is uh yeah hosting this thank you i love that too first day i'm going to use that 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 metaphor and that imagery to park my viewpoint over here, you know, out of the swirling mechanism. I was a debater, you know, and that, that does not, that served me as a lawyer, but not as a human being, you know, like, well, lawyers are human beings, but like to park my viewpoint um, over here so I don't have to continually counterpoint it all, yeah. you know, to find out where I might be, just like park it. <clears throat> you know, but like, I, I have that vision of my ego too, that put it on my left shoulder. When I'm doing like my job, I. I can kind of do that, but when I'm like in conversation, so thank you for that. I, I think we can all benefit from that. You yeah. know, imagine if Baba argued with each of us. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Julie, how are you doing, Julie? I can see you in the in the shadows. <clears throat> Yeah, I couldn't move because of the cat. You know how cats make oh, you yeah. stay in the same place. But yeah. Um, yeah, now I could move to something brighter, but I, I kind of like the shadows. Yeah. Nice um, I'm you. going through like all of these same things. It seems like we're on a wave with uh, effort and grace. So I, it's like I've never needed to s speak for a while because everyone's bringing up the same points that I've been through all week. So. Yeah. It's uh, it's it's intense, but I don't really have to think about it. It's just a like a wave moving through me. Beautiful, yeah, yeah. No, the, I'm really grateful you're keeping this up. Yeah, everybody kind of came back. I didn't know, um, <clears throat> every, you know, everybody would come back again. You know, for for um, you <laughs> know to repeat the uh, the the ninth grade again. <laughs> Well, you know what you said, Jeff, about they all, people always follow the love or come back to the love. Yeah, <laughs> it applies to this too. Yeah. Come back to the love, <clears throat> the oracle sources of love. Yeah, yeah, I would consider it a type of uh, grounding or steadying influence for the rest of the week. So, really appreciate yeah. that we're still doing it. And the, and the beautiful thing is, even though we all have a unique path to Baba, we overlap in so many ways. You know, I mean, the obstacles that we come up with, we all share. They're kind of universal in this. And, you know, I know what during um, the Yusa Havas, they, they had a discussion group on how to, you know, these are all high school kids, uh, how to... Um, how to bring up Baba, how to answer the question, who is that? Who is Baba among your peer group? You know, I mean, they all had great difficulties. You know, many of them had great difficulties on how to, you know, what, who's that guy on your parents' wall? You got, you got this, who's that guy on the wall? And how to answer those questions? Because they were all faced in growing up in Baba families with the difficulty of having to explain <clears throat> and so <clears throat> and they were all you know these were very um engaging discussions because everybody had a, a different situation but uh, really quite the same problem in a different context and i'm sure thea you know he had his troubles <laughs> explaining who this May her Baba was. Well, don't you feel that you're saying something different for the audience, for whoever, whoever is asking in the moment? Yeah. And 
how you're prompted to respond to that? Sure. Um, I mean, it depends. At first, we would just say what we were taught about it, and that, you know, this is, we believe this to be a Jesus or Buddha, etc. cetera. Um, and then it shifts at some point, or it shifts for a lot of people at some point where it's either uh, you become more circumspect about it, or you, um, you know, continue on with that. A lot of people, you know, like you say, it depends on the person, but at first, like you would just tell everybody um, that and uh, didn't often go very well. So depending on where you were, so. Yeah. <clears throat> Your godfather. Yeah. Um, Your uncle. <laughs> sometimes I, people would just say, oh, is that so-and-so? And I would just say, yes. Like, is that your dad? Is that, you know, Jesus? Is that, and I would just go, yeah. <laughs> and, he, very and he is whatever you take him to be, so why not? <laughs> um, yeah, I've said the same thing. Yeah, whatever they say. Someone said, um, is that you? And I was so surprised because the gender difference, but he was wearing the, the sadra. So I said, yeah, that's me. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, it's, yeah, these are all. Oh. If I can give you a suggestion for your next time around as a kid on the playground, don't tell Christians that you love like when they're beating you up telling you to say you love jesus that you do that bob is the same person it doesn't go over very well so just yeah <clears throat> yeah he's i think guy. he's the same guy he's come again they say he'll come again and he did yeah. But also, that doesn't work somehow. Uh, also, don't point out that uh, that Jesus would not be happy with them hitting you to say love Jesus, but that doesn't work either. Yeah. <laughs> Ooh. Ask me how I know. <laughs> yeah. 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 He, he had P. Uh, uh, whatever. Uh, PTSD. You know, when he left high school, just from. <laughs> Although, entertainingly enough, I now go to a church very regularly and am quite open about my beliefs, and everybody's great about it. So, yeah, you know, maybe you'd be fine. <laughs> uh, Alan, I am. It's, uh, I'm talking to Angela about what time because of uh, Alan was asking, we were talking about having an ongoing weekly checking group about how Baba shows up in your daily life. It's a group I led at the Young Adult Sahabas a week ago and um so we were talking about having them and have them be a kind of ongoing thing that is open to everyone but is young adult led or youth led to um kind of keep that kind of uh you know buzz and linda commented on how we are with each other is a little different with how their generation is with each other um and kind of our idea with this is to have it be open um but to be led by the young adults so that um all people could kind of get a taste of how that functions maybe um and uh but the idea of it is just like you know uh, a way that baba showed up in a mundane manner in your daily life like to tell a story that happened to you sometime recently doesn't have preferably not even a huge thing um, but just to, like there's little yeah. millions of little ways because remembrance, um, acknowledgement and gratitude helps remembrance. Um, yes, so, beautiful. Um, yeah. And <clears throat> we're trying to find a time for it. It will probably be, I want it to be after eight if it's on a weeknight so that people on the West Coast can attend it. But then there's very limited time slots for that. Um, and we butt up against RT very quickly. And I can't do the super late night stuff like y'all do. I get very sleepy and cranky if I don't. Because I am 40 now. As, no, I don't look it, but. Oh, yeah. You are old. I know, right? You're, ca you're starting the downhill slope now. Oh, my God. I've got all these like procedures over the next <laughs> couple of weeks because the warranty wore off basically the moment I turned 40. So it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Planned obsolescence. What is this? 
<laughs> well, if you ever want to come to Radiant Health on Tuesday nights, we talk about that, like how like one of the last things Baba said to the Mandali was take care of your health. And the last session in the five series is about the kingdom of heaven on earth. Like the body is instrumental for bringing the kingdom of heaven on earth. And I was thinking that when Farish Day read that um, Hafiz translation about what I heard was heaven has recited your love loveliness or it has, you know, something about that in our loveliness. And then after this five series ends, it's going to pick up in December with Baba at one of the RTs in the last uh, week, told, you know, I could feel saying continue that series and base it on the Australian RT and each of the five session be one of the five stanzas and invite people to, you know, come in. There's so much richness about illumination and about the sun. Like even uh, Farish Day said at the end of that, that guzzle or the poem 22, the essence of wine manifests only when the sun shines upon the world. I'm like, oh wonderful yeah yeah <clears throat> well if there is there anything else otherwise i'm going to get something to eat um elizabeth you got anything that comes occurs to you no thank you just thank you these meetings are so wonderful oh, and it's always nice to have you all in my living room. Yeah. I look forward to it every week and RT and whatever else I can get onto. Yeah, and you're in, so. in uh, within uh, uh, throwing distance of the, uh, <clears throat> the national capital. Silver Spring, Maryland. I know, but well, you're, you're, you're under that, um, I mean, there's an intensity around that whole area. We're in the fire here. Good that you're good that you're there with Baba. Yeah, yeah some of us have to yeah. hold Baba here. Hopefully yeah. things will get better. Yeah. Shape Baba, everybody. Yeah. Baba. Good. I'm gonna stop the recording now. Angela asked me to, if that's okay. okay. I think okay. Well, you guys.